Mary Shelley's Frankenstein has captivated readers for over 200 years. It was a story of its time representing a world torn between religious and moral responsibilities, alchemy science and of course the big questions. What is the essence of life? What is consciousness? And where does the soul reside? Dr. Anton Mesmer seemed to have uncovered the answer in the form of a medium that pervades all living things. He called it animal magnetism. It was believed psychic healers such as Edgar Cayce channeled their powers through this medium. However, animal magnetism was demonised and dismissed, and yet powerful intelligent people, governments and members of secret societies paid enormous fees to get exclusive access to Mesmer's secrets. Mesmer's ideas were both revered and ridiculed, but recent scientific discoveries suggest there may be more to this phenomenon than we first imagined. The first publication of Anton Mesmer's ideas on a universal fluid was a dissertation he presented to the University of Vienna in 1766. The 32-year-old Mesmer proclaimed the existence of an invisible substance that ebbs and flows through all things and had the power to heal. Owing to the fact that it could be affected by magnets, he named it animal magnetism. He went on to postulate that all illnesses could ultimately be traced to an imbalance or a lack of animal magnetism within the nervous system, a problem that could be addressed by using magnets to realign or boost the magnetic medium. While his dissertation laid the foundations for his theory, he and many others spent the following years developing the idea further. However, the concept wasn't new. From ancient time, mankind believed that an invisible ether was the underlying force of the universe, the cause of light and heat and the vitality of plants. According to Mesmer, the human consisted of four great divisions, a material body, a mental power, a soul, and lastly, this vital principle, which is the magnetic force that gives strength and animation to the body. Mesmer believed that a person through their willpower could set in motion the ether resident in the nerves of another person, paralyze their external senses and control their mind. In blocking the external senses like this, the internal spirit is freed from the ordinary influences of the body as it would be in death. In this state, various phenomena could occur, including somnambulism, which is a trance-like state, clairvoyance, telepathy, communication with spirit, and an unusual ability to describe internal organs and diseases within oneself and in others. Although some may view the claims as improbable, specific cases present a compelling evidence, even by today's standards. For example, a French medical student named Charles Poyne was so moved by the healing that he himself received from a mesmerised clairvoyant that he relocated to the United States to perform public experiments on the topic. His main magnetic subject was a young invalid woman by the name of Cynthia Gleason, who would amaze audiences while in a trance state with her ability to diagnose internal diseases. And then in France, a substantial report was made by the medical faculty of Montpellier on the experiments of one of its most respected physicians, Dr. Pigier. The report contained the examiner's testimonies purporting that Dr. Pigier's subject, his 11-year-old daughter, read admirably well from any proffered book despite being blindfolded with a thick and double velvet bandage that was perfectly fixed to the nose and cheeks with a sticky plaster. Meanwhile, in the UK, there was accounts of surgical operations performed with the benefit of animal magnetism. The first account relates the story of a 42-year-old James Womble who required an amputation of the leg above the knee joint. Mr. Womble was mesmerised repetitively over a period of three weeks, until such a point that he was suitably insensible enough to operate upon. Despite moaning at intervals throughout the operation, he remained in a deep sleep with a serene expression that never faltered. A second case involving an amputation of the thigh on a patient named Marianne Lacken in Leicester was similarly described, in that there appeared to be a complete absence of pain and muscle movement, and a serene expression throughout. These were not the only operations that involved mesmerism. In general, it was found the subjects that were operated on could not be awakened by external injuries inflicted upon the body. Animal magnetism had already been debated for over a century when the American newspapers published the story of a young Edgar Cayce puzzling physicians with his ability to perfectly describe and diagnose patient cases, knowing nothing whatever of physiology or anatomy. Cayce's extraordinary abilities captured attention, but there were many other mesmerizing cases that history has forgotten. Mesmer's determination to share his discovery brought forth fascinating stories, but the road to its acceptance was paved with accusations, mockery and humiliation. He met his greatest adversary at the beginning of his animal magnetism journey. Father Maximilian Hell, a Jesuit professor of astronomy in Vienna, claimed to be the true inventor of Mesmer's theory. Father Hell, who supplied the magnets to Mesmer, alleged he had given the suggestion to Mesmer years earlier. The 40-year-old Mesmer disputed this, declaring that when he communicated his healing success to Father Hell, the Jesuit monk hurried to publish the theory, telling all that Mesmer was doing the experiments under his direction. Mesmer believed his saving grace in the credit battle would be the fact he had kept a vital piece of information from Father Hell. In his publication, Father Hell had attributed the success of magnetic therapy to the magnetic structure, whereas Mesmer's theory relied on the magnetism of the operator and not on the magnets themselves. Mesmer's offers to prove the distinctions between his observations and the means he employed from those that were published by Father Hell were rejected by the faculty. 
feeling hard done by the determined Mesmer went against the advice of the faculty and publicly demonstrated his protest against Father Hell. He believed this led to the Society of Jesus organising secret and unrelenting revenge against him, his doctrine and his pupils. Having no choice but go his own way, he erected a hospital for the poor, where he discovered that his healing process could work without the need of the magnets. But instead of publishing his discovery, Mesmer shrouded himself in mystery and began to be looked upon as either a swindler or a visionary. In the midst of the media frenzy surrounding him and Father Hell, one of the most famous cases of animal magnetism in marriage was that of Maria Teresa Pardi, a young vocalist and concert pianist. Blind from infancy with bulging eyes and suffering violent manic fits that caused the eyeballs to fall from their sockets, the 18-year-old was brought to Mesmer in the hopes that he could cure her disabilities. Mesmer's treatment seemed to have a dramatic effect in Pardi and soon news of her case spread throughout Europe, attracting crowds to witness the indisputable success. The two presidents of the medical faculty, who had attended to her unsuccessfully for over 10 years, expressed their astonishment at her recovery and regret for not having previously endorsed the significance of Mesmer's discovery. To Mesmer, everything seemed to indicate an impending and resounding victory. When the victory failed to come to pass, Mesmer realised the massive power he had offended when he went up against Father Hell. Interested in his downfall, they presented to Miss Parody's father that should it be known that she was cured, the Empress would no longer pay the illness pension granted on account of her infirmities. The father, fearing the loss of the long-term pension, pulled his daughter out of Mesmer's care and residency. Once back in the family home, her condition deteriorated and the old symptoms and blindness returned. This fueled the cynics who accused Mesmer of being a fraudulent charlatan and cast doubt on the authenticity of Parody's condition, implying she was either exaggerating or feigning blindness for personal gain. Mesmer fled to France, humiliated and defeated, while Father Hell basked in academic glory. Despite his attempts to keep a low profile in France, Newspaper articles depicted his arrival as a calculated move, a swindler lord to the city's den of fraudsters. They painted a picture of him establishing a sham scientific enterprise that promised immediate and perfect health through the use of magic. His operations were conducted in a dimly lit chamber, adorned with mirrors and accompanied by the haunting melodies of the harmonicon. At the core of the enterprise was a baquette, a tub of sorcery. Around this tub, Mesmer would position his patients in tears, each grasping an iron rod that was linked to the tub. By pressing the rod against the afflicted areas, the magic fluid would flow through them. Wearing silk robes and brandishing a wand, Mesmer would claim to be the source of the mesmerizing power. As he made grand gestures, the patients would succumb to violent spasms, which he then touted as evidence of his powers. The French government under Louis XVI, in an effort to gain insights into Mesmer's secrets, offered him a generous yearly pension. Mesmer's decline of the offer led to more persecution and mockery. A group of scholars then came forward with an offer exceeding that of the kings, one that would involve the establishment of a society called the Harmony. One of the purposes of this society was to preserve the integrity of Mesmer's theory and to ensure that they were only passed down to those who were deemed worthy of the knowledge. But animal magnetism would fall into the hands of unqualified practitioners, leading it open to great abuse. Mesmer's reputation was lowered in the eyes of the well-informed and scientific, who ridiculed him for refusing to impart his secret to the government, and rather preferring to make it known to the ignorant. He withdrew his school from all scrutiny and refused communications with the committees appointed by King Louis XVI to investigate the claims of animal magnetism. These committees decided that there was not sufficient evidence exhibited to show that the remarkable effects they witnessed were caused by the actions of a fluid. They attributed the results to the influence of the imagination. Mesmer left Paris and lived for many years in anonymity at Meersburg on the Boden Lake in Germany. He died on the 5th of March 1815 at 80 years of age. In his later days, he had the satisfaction of perceiving that his merits were more duly appreciated when the Academy of Berlin sent Carl Christian Wolfhardt to journey to Switzerland to document his thoughts and notes on healing. It was really only after Mesmer's death that his teachings would become more widespread. A few years after his passing, the Boston Medical Association in the US established a committee of 24 men to investigate animal magnetism. They concluded there were certain appearances which could not be explained upon the supposition of collusion or by any physiological principles known to them. This result opened the door for, to a great number of physicians, professors and lawyers to enter the field as lecturers and practical magnetizers. Within a short number of years, many papers were written on the subject, hospitals were erected for the application of its power, and colleges were granted professorships in magnetism. But while those early days were marked by enthusiasm and optimism, sceptics have been very vocal in criticising Mesmer's hypothesis as being nothing more than a patchwork of ideas borrowed from contemporary sources. Mesmer's dissertation drew upon basic ideas that were not new but had originated from ancient times, they were part of the standard curriculum of the seven liberal arts the students of the time were expected to master. Mesmer explained the motivation that lay behind his work, his belief that many popular ideologies were rooted in ancient wisdom, prompted him to examine the popular study of astrology, 
in order to ascertain if it contained information worth preserving. As the practice of mesmerism gained popularity, it also garnered a reputation for malevolence and evil. Religious and media organisations demonised it as a form of sorcery and cautioned people to be wary of mesmerists who may exert their influence at any time, even through casual conversation. Women were seen as particularly susceptible to these supposed influences. The term malicious animal magnetism was coined to describe this threat and laws were put in place to restrict its practice to licensed practitioners. The fear surrounding mesmerism was so intense that medical professionals who had a genuine interest in the subject needed to distance themselves from the terms animal magnetism and mesmerism. A Scottish physician named James Braid took a new approach. He concluded that the physical effects attributed to animal magnetism were actually the result of suggestion and the power of the mind. Braid's solution was to introduce the concept of hypnotism, which he believed could induce anesthesia through suggestion. This was a groundbreaking discovery that led the foundation for modern hypnotherapy and the use of suggestion in pain management. With Braid's work, mesmerism was transformed from a dark malevolent force to a legitimate medical tool. While the properties of magnets and electricity were relatively unknown in Mesmer's time, he believed he had discovered what he called a sixth sense, an invisible magnetic force that permeated the human body and could be harnessed and manipulated for healing purposes. He was so steadfast in his belief that he dedicated his life to studying the phenomena and was desirous for science to continue his research. While his contemporaries ridiculed his ideas, recent scientific research has shed new lights on the potential validity of some aspects of his theories. We now know that humans and all matter possess weak magnetic properties. In humans and animals, whose atoms are repelled by magnetic fields, the phenomenon is called diamagnetism. In the mid-1960s, zoologist Wolfgang Wilsko demonstrated an ability in European robins to sense magnetic fields. Then in the 1980s, Robin Baker's field studies with students from Manchester University demonstrated how humans may also have a magnetic sense. But it wasn't until more recent years that the full extent of magnetic sensation was truly understood. Wilsko and his wife Rosita and other scientists over the years have demonstrated that many organisms possess an internal magnetic compass. These findings appear to be confirmed by studies at Caltech that show the human brain's alpha waves responding to controlled magnetic fields. So could Mesmer have been right all along? Was he onto something that would take centuries for science to fully comprehend? While definitive answers remain elusive, there is no denying that Mesmer's ideas sparked a shift in scientific thinking leading to the exploration of hypnosis, the study of magnetosensation and ongoing research into the relationship between magnetic fields and human biology. His legacy, or at least the parts that he revealed, have made an indelible mark in the fields of psychology and medicine. Perhaps the sixth sense that he dedicated his life to studying will one day unlock even greater mysteries of the human mind and body, only time will tell. Now we set a thing like this in motion. It's wonderful, the attraction, on the feeble-minded, of course. The continuous motion, if they just let themselves follow it. We hope our journey through the realm of animal magnetism has sparked your curiosity. There are still many fascinating rabbit holes to delve into within this vast subject. We invite you to continue your journey with us to uncover the mysteries that lie ahead. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. When you're driving, the rhythm is smooth, unbroken, and the road goes on and on, round and round, always the same, winding and winding, and you're drowsy, you're tired, let the road come into you as it were, the long road, the smooth road. The road to sleep.